Thank you for joining with us today. And uh, we're going to continue our journey today trying to answer the question, why did Jesus die? So what have we heard so far in uh, last week and in this uh, AV we just saw? Well, first of all, we just heard that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary because of God's love for us, because of God's love for us. That was God's motivation. But why was that act of love necessary? And simply stated, the reason behind that extraordinary act of love was humanity's sin. So in this session, we're going to be looking at the the problem that was faced by God because of our sin, look at his solution, and then look at the result of that solution, what that has meant to us. And the first thing is, of course, is the problem. The problem is our sin. Now, sin, that's an uncomfortable word in our world today, and it's certainly, it's a word that perhaps has even had a change of meaning in our culture. Sin has almost become like a, a good word. One uh, advertisement for ice cream used the slogan, it's so good, it's sinful. So good, it's sinful. But sin as addressed in the Bible, is not good, it is not helpful, it is the bad stuff of human behaviour. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Well, the first part, I think, is is very easy for all of us to understand, and that is that all of us have sinned. I don't know anybody, I don't think I've ever met anybody with any real understanding of what sin is who would deny that they have sinned and that they do sin. Now, often, of course, we we try to blame others for the wrong that we do. Maybe uh, my wife pressed my buttons or the boss is so unfair and so frustrating. But if we're honest with ourselves, let alone with God, we would all admit that we do wrong, that we sin, in fact. Just speaking of excuses for, for the wrong we do, I was amused to read uh, some of the excuses people make for being involved in car accidents, in the things they put into their claim forms. One man wrote this, Going home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that wasn't there. (laughs) Someone else said, I've been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. (laughs) Someone else said, the pedestrian had no idea which way to go, so I ran over him. (laughs) And finally, probably tops it all, I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law and headed over the embankment. (laughs) We make excuses, but truth is, no matter what excuses we dream up, we've all done stuff that we know is wrong. And Paul, in what he wrote and what we just read, simply confirms what we already know to be true of us personally when he says, all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But what does the second part mean? What does it mean to fall short of the glory of God? That takes some explanation. Consider this. Someone comes to us and says, well, I've got no need of God. I lead a good life. Well, let's uh, use an illustration. Suppose there's this virtue scale, and it's like on the side of the curtain there. And uh, we say to the person, well, you're looking at, uh, I guess, the different virtues of people. Who would you put at the top? And they would say, well, uh, Mother Teresa or maybe my mother. And, and who would you put at the bottom? And they say, well, Adolf Hitler or maybe Idi Amin. And uh, so where would, you, where would you go? And uh, then I guess we'd all agree that we're somewhere in between Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler. We're somewhere on that scale. And of course, uh, you would be sort of fairly far up the scale and I may be a bit below you. You know, I'm sure you'd all agree with that. That's uh, how it would be. But we'd say, well, but what is the standard? What is the standard on that scale? 
And you might say to me, well, I guess it's the, the ceiling. The ceiling is the scale. You know, Mother Teresa is a little bit below that and I'm a little bit further down, but I guess the ceiling is the scale. But what does that verse say? That verse says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, the standard's not the ceiling. The standard is the sky. The standard is the sky. The glory of God was revealed in Jesus and compared to him, compared to any understanding of what a perfect, holy God is, we all fall a very, very long way short. So you might respond to, to that illustration, that statement. Well, if that's the case, we're all in the same boat. What does it, what does it matter? But the New Testament tells us it does matter and for a number of reasons. And we put these under four P's just to make them easy to remember. First of all, why sin matters is because there is the pollution of sin. The pollution of sin. The things that we do wrong spoil our lives. Has anyone else experienced that? The pollution of, of the environment is a real problem today, as we know. But Jesus says it's possible to pollute your soul. The stuff that we do wrong harms us and it harms others. It's polluting. Then there's the power of sin. The power of sin. The bad stuff in our life, the bad habits, uh, they're very addictive. And again, we've all experienced that. Jesus said, whoever sins is the slave of sin. Sin can control us. It can completely derail a human life. Sin, the power of sin. The third P is the penalty of sin. You know, there's something within us, every one of us, every human being, that cries out for justice. When we see these horrific things were going on around the world, ISIS and other things, um, we, we, we cry out and we say that ought not to be hap happen and those things should be stopped and the people who do them should be brought to justice. Our intuition, our human intuition, it's built into us, is that there has to be a penalty for doing wrong. There just has to be. We have an inner sense that that is so. But isn't it true that we, we often have a very different standard for other people than we have for ourselves when it comes to this. Have you ever got a tiny bit grumpy with someone else's traffic infraction? You know, cutting you off, turning from the wrong lane, not indicating. And then we've been quite forgetful of the fact that we've also cut corners on the road from time to time, right? In Romans 2.1, we read, you therefore have no excuse when you pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same thing. And I think we're all guilty at times, every one of us, of judging ourselves with more mercy than we extend to others. Then there's the fourth P, is the partition of sin. You know how it is when you've offended somebody or they've offended you? You avoid them. You don't want to look them in the eye. You, you keep out of their way because something's come between us. And uh, what the New Testament says is the stuff that we do wrong, the sin we do, has caused a petition between us and God. So these things, the pollution, the power, the, the, the penalty, the partition of sin, that's the bad news. So everyone just go home now and meditate on that. Now, of course, there's good news. There's a solution. And that is what we want to address right now. The solution is God's gift of self-sacrifice. God loves you and he's acted on that love. Galatians 2.20 says, The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. If you were to fall asleep at this point and not hear another point I make in this message, if you could get that in your heart, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, you would leave this church a better person, in a better place. If you could just get hold of that one truth today. 
God has not left us just to sink in our sin. But God has come to this earth in the person of his son, Jesus, to do something about it, to do something about it. In fact, to die for you and for me. The Apostle Peter put it this way. He himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins, that your sins and my sins, that is, in his body on the tree, on the cross. It's just another way of referring to the cross, the tree. By his wounds you have been healed. This has been described as like the self-substitution of God. God himself substituted for you and for me. But what does that mean? We're just going to listen to Nicky Gumbel as he tells a most extraordinary story of sacrifice. Let's listen to that. On the 31st of July, 1941, sirens rang out from cell block 14 in Auschwitz concentration camp. A prisoner had escaped. And as a reprisal, the Gestapo selected 10 men, arbitrarily, to die in a starvation bunker. The ninth man selected was a man called Francis Gajewniczek. And when he was selected, Francis Gajewniczek cried out. He said, oh, he said, my poor wife and my children, they will never see me again. At that moment, a, a small man with wireframe glasses took off his cap and he walked forward and he said, I'm a Catholic priest. He said, I don't have a, a wife and children. I want to die instead of that man. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. The name of that man was Maximilian Kolbe, 47 years old. And he was taken with the other nine to the starvation bunker. An amazing guy. He, he got them praying, singing hymns. Apparently the atmosphere in there was, felt like a church in there. Eventually they needed the starvation bunker for other people. And so on the 14th of August, 1941, he was given a lethal injection of carbolic acid. 41 years later, on the 10th of October 1982, the death of Maximilian Kolbe was put in its proper perspective. There in St. Peter's Square, Rome, in a crowd of 150,000 people with 26 cardinals, 300 bishops and archbishops, was Francis Gajewniczek. And the Pope described the death of Maximilian Kolbe on that occasion in these terms. He said it was a victory like that won by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Maximilian Kolbe had died for someone else instead of someone else. That someone else was Francis Gajewniczek. I happened to see his obituary in the independent newspaper. He died at the age of 93. And he had spent the rest of his life going around the world telling people what Maximilian Kolbe had done for him because he had died in his place. And in an even more remarkable way, Jesus died instead of you and instead of me. Yeah, what a remarkable story. Now Jesus died on a, a Roman cross which was a particularly cruel and painful punishment and yet the New Testament doesn't really concentrate on the physical aspect of the crucifixion what it focuses on is what was unique about Jesus death and that is he was suffering spiritually because he was bearing on himself your sin and my sin our guilt our shame there's a verse in the Old Testament which prophesied the death of Jesus and it goes like this. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we might explain that verse like, like this. Let this hand represent me and you. And let this book represent all of the bad stuff, all of the sin that separates us from God. Let this hand represent Jesus. He did nothing wrong. There's nothing between him and 
the relationship with his father. And then on the cross, the sin and iniquity of all of us was laid upon Jesus. And where did that leave us? Free and unhindered in our relationship with God. So what's the result? What's the result? We've heard that God has had a solution in Jesus dying on the cross for us. What is the result of that? Well, the result is that we now receive all the benefits of God's love. The result of the cross and, and the subsequent resurrection of Jesus from the dead is that we can freely receive all the benefits that come with a relationship with God. Guilt and shame have no more place in our lives when we receive what Christ has done for us. Guilt is feeling bad about the stuff that we do. Shame is feeling bad about who we are. And Jesus bore our guilt and our shame. And we never need to feel bad about ourselves in that sense towards God because we are loved. You know, really your worth, if we want to talk about self-worth today, your ultimate worth is what you are worth to God. And what are you worth to him? You are worth the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God's son, on your behalf. That is what you're worth to God. So in all this, can we, can we see how, how Jesus revealed what true love is? True love is not just a feeling. It's not just a thought. True love involves more than just words, more than just feelings. It involves actions. And Jesus showed us the supreme example of love by sacrificing himself for you and for me. The cross of Jesus also tells us that evil, all evil, all sin in the world has been defeated. The powers of evil behind that have been defeated by the cross and that there's going to be a good ending. The resurrection was the, was the manifestation of a remarkable God-ordained victory. And it tells us that the story will end well. So the four Ps that we looked at before have all been reversed. They've all been turned around. And so we're going to take them in the opposite way to how we first looked at them. First of all, the partition has been removed. You can come home to God. St Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world, that is you and me, to himself. God was in Christ on the cross. God himself came to die for you and for me. God was in Christ reconciling you and me to himself. And reconciliation is an amazing thing. One of the most well-known stories of Jesus is that of the prodigal son. If you don't know what that's about, it's about a man who has gone his own way, completely gone his own way, metaphorically spat in the face of his father and then is welcomed home again by that same father and reinstated to all the privileges and joys of sonship, of being a son, a daughter of the father. That's what that story is about and that's what the cross is about. And our reconciliation with God overflows beyond ourselves. It leads to reconciliation in marriage, in family, in our friendships, between parents and children. It leads to all kinds of reconciliation because God implants and then flows out reconciliation from us. The next thing we see is that the penalty has been paid. The penalty has been paid. The guilt has been removed. There's now no condemnation. We have been justified. Justified is, a, is like a legal term. It means just as if I'd never sinned. If you were justified in the courts, you were acquitted. We have been acquitted by God. Here's a little story. It's just an analogy. It's not a true story. It's just an analogy. 
that might help you understand that. There were two friends. They were friends at school and then they were friends at university. And one became uh, a lawyer and very successful and eventually became a judge. The other, his life got somewhat derailed. He, he went into a life of crime. And one day the criminal appeared before his old friend, the judge. And the judge recognised him. He had a dilemma. What was he to do? He, he loved his friend. He would do anything for that friend. The friend had pleaded guilty to the crime because he knew he had he'd done it. But the judge couldn't just let him off because he had to be just. He had to follow through justice. And that's God's dilemma, if you like. God is a God of justice. If there was no justice in the world, the world would be a terrible place. But he also loves you. So this is what the judge did in that story. He, he, he fined his friend the appropriate penalty, let's say $20,000. That was justice. Justice was served in that moment. Then he took off his robes and left the bench, came down to where his friend was and wrote out a cheque for $20,000 and gave it to his friend. And that was love. And that's what Jesus has done for us. Only more amazing because the cost was not $20,000. It was his death on the cross. And we're in a much worse situation than the friend of the judge. And it needed a greater solution. The love was far greater too. It wasn't just two friends. It was the love of the father for the son even greater than that. And then the power of sin has been broken. The power of sin has been broken. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, if Jesus sets you free, you will be free indeed. You know, the power of sin is always a problem in our life. Whether we're a Christian or not a Christian, the power of sin is always going to be a problem. But I know that its power has become less powerful over time because of Jesus' life in me. There are two theological words of importance here. The first is justification, as I mentioned a bit earlier. Justification happens instantly. Justification means I'm put right with God. That happens the moment we receive Christ. We are made righteous before God. There's no condemnation. There's no guilt. In other words, when God looks upon us, he justifies us. He sees us clean. We no longer have the penalty of our sin upon us. He sees us as being totally free. That's justification. It's instantaneous. But sanctification is another word. Sanctification talks about us becoming like Jesus. And that's a lifeline, lifetime process. That never ends. So we don't get upset too much with ourselves uh, in our battle against our inner tendencies towards sin but we find that as we trust in Jesus those tendencies become weaker and weaker as we give Jesus more and more power in our lives. So the power of sin has been broken and then the pollution has been removed. There is continual forgiveness in our life. John wrote that the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us, takes away the pollution, cleanses us from all sin. And that's, that's amazing. That's wonderful that, we've can be, that we can be, have this burden of sin just lifted off our shoulders. And, and when we've experienced God's forgiveness for ourselves, it makes a huge difference and it makes that we then want to forgive also. We want to turn that forgiveness that God has given to us and pour it out to others. Unforgiveness or holding a grudge is uh, like allowing the other person to live rent free in your head. It doesn't do them any harm but it does you a great deal of harm. Unforgiveness doesn't hurt anybody other than ourselves. Someone said unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping that the other person will die. But when we've experienced God's forgiveness, we don't want to do that. We want to forgive. I just say as an aside, 
that, that sometimes the, the hardest thing for some is to forgive themselves. For many, it's easier to forgive other people than to forgive ourselves for what we have done. But as C.S. Lewis said concerning that, if God has forgiven us, if God has forgiven us, God, and we refuse to forgive ourselves, it's like setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than God. Does that make sense? God forgives you, forgive yourself. And we forgive others because we've been forgiven so much. Forgiveness is a choice, it's not, but it's not optional. And we know sometimes it's hard, but it's to be done. C.S. Lewis again said, Everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive, and then it's really hard. But hard as it might be, total, unlimited forgiveness transforms our relationships, our marriage, our family relationships, our friendships, our workplaces. Forgiveness is transformational. Corrie ten Boom was an amazing Dutch Christian who during the war, her and her family hid Jews from the Nazis. And she was caught and arrested as was her father and her sister and they were taken to concentration camps. Her father died and her sister Betsy, who went to, with her to Ravensbrück, died also in that concentration camp. But amazingly, Corrie survived. And after the war, she went around the whole world talking about forgiveness, just giving the message of God's forgiveness. And one time in 1947, she was in a church in Munich and when she finished her talk, this man came up to her and she recognised him as one of the guards in Ravensbrook. He didn't recognise her, but she recognised him. And she could remember his cruelty, the specific cruelty of this man. And he came up to her and said, thank you for your message. It is a wonderful message of, of forgiveness. I have become a Christian and I know that God has forgiven me. I want to know that you have forgiven me. And he stuck out his hand and said, shake my hand as a sign that you've forgiven me. And Corrie said, she just froze. All the memories of her sister dying in that camp and his cruelty came back into her head. In this next AV, she's going to talk about that experience. Bill, you forgive me. And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. This unforgiven, unconditional forgiveness that comes from God, as I said, transforms our lives, transforms our marriages, our families, our friendships, all our relationships. God loves you and me completely. You are loved. The Son of God gave himself for every one of us here today. And when we understand that, when we really grasp the meaning of that in our lives, it will totally change us. Because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we're going to celebrate communion together. Communion is a Christian celebration of uh, remembrance, thanksgiving and praise to God for all that Jesus did for us on the cross 
and his resurrection. I'm going to invite you to please remain seated as the elements are distributed and hold them and we will eat and drink together. If you're visiting with us today and communion is unfamiliar to you, feel free to allow the elements to pass you by. Thank you to our team.